afternoon and welcome to our panel on diversity and inclusion and innovation. We're going to outline today the reasons that it's interesting to invest in both innovation as well as inclusion. I'm Lisa Diaz, President and CEO of Prince Street Capital Management. We are an Emerging Markets Innovation Fund. And I want to um, extend a special thanks to Anthony Scaramucci and John Darcy, as well as Joe Aletto, for organizing and supporting this important panel today. So innovation has become a consensus good. The market is thirsty for more innovation as a source of economic returns. Innovation, by its very nature, is about challenging the status quo. It's about finding new solutions to age-old problems and addressing friction points. In the asset management business, what's the biggest friction point? How do you generate alpha? And how do you deliver outsized returns? We believe that diversity in perspective, insight, experience, and styles provided by women-led managers and minority managers is an undervalued asset. A recent Goldman Sachs analysis of portfolio management performance actually found out that diverse managers outperformed by 100 basis points. Think what that means over a decade timeframe. However, in the US, only 3% of total assets are controlled by women-led firms. That means that 97% of total assets are managed by the traditional power group, AKA people who have a tendency to have a similar perspective. So we think that represents an arbitrage because despite the small numbers, nearly 30% of top quartile managers are in fact women. So that's a great opportunity for allocators. We see inclusion as the next big innovation and in asset management business, and we ex hope that more capital should be allocated to women-led managers because it makes economic sense, because it delivers returns. I'm very honored um, to be here with four trendsetters, innovators, change agents, who have been the forefront of transforming the face of finance. To my left, Kathy Wood, who is founder, CEO, and CIO of ARC Asset, who blazed a new path dedicated to innovation investing and has disrupted the asset management industry through her success in raising over $80 billion in AUM. And now some of the major mutual fund um, complexes, such as JP Morgan and the American funds, are following Kathy's suit. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Next to our left, we have Jolene Caruso Fitzgerald, who is Divisional Vice Chairman of Global Wealth Management at UBS. She oversees UBS's top advisors who work exclusively with global ultra net families. And she was the founder of the Aberleen Group, a woman-owned and woman-led boutique investment bank. Before that, she was president and co-founder of the $8 billion Ander Capital um, hedge fund complex as well as earlier in her career was both a managing director at Lehman and JP Morgan Securities. Next, we have Michaela Edwards, who is partner and portfolio manager at Capricorn Investment Group, one of the largest mission aligned firms in the world with over $8 billion invested for families, foundations, and institutional clients. Prior to Capricorn, Michaela spent nine years as a portfolio manager at Norges Bank, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway overseeing a $10 billion portfolio. And finally, we have Luo Mansani, who is Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager at Ariel Investments International Global Equity Strategy. She's a three-time entrepreneur, having founded multi-million dollar in international equities capabilities throughout her 30-year career. Not once, but three times. Once at Oppenheimer, at McKay Shields, and now at Ariel Investments. So this is a rock store group of thought leaders in the industry. So to cap off our conversation on innovation and inclusion, Kathy, can we start with you? Um, 
I would love for you to share your thoughts on innovation as ARC Investment has literally created a new asset class and has harnessed the power of ETFs and evolved the thinking with Ram Dobbs coming up with a new set of KPIs. So tell us what you're thinking about these days and how you came up with the inspiration for this new asset class. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, well, in uh, I, I started in our business a very long time ago, 1977. I was uh, in college at the time, and I worked at Capital Group. And uh, as many of you know, Capital Group, Group is known for its in-depth research. And uh, I remember being 1977, and I was put on a project uh, to work with a team focused on Hong Kong 1997. And I said, I want to be in this business. I want to understand how the world is going to work. Uh, fast forward, you know, great two decades, 80s and 90s, tech and telecom bust, 08, 09, incredible risk aversion, uh, I would say permeating our industry, and this concept of benchmarks and indexes directing investors as to how they should invest. And um, our strategy, which is all about innovation in a traditional asset management firm, was looking more and more like an odd duck and uh, not receiving the support that uh, I thought it should. And I just said, okay, there is a huge arbitrage opportunity out there. Just what you said in your intro, huge arbitrage opportunity. The private markets are pricing innovation here, sometimes five and 10 times higher than the public markets were willing to price innovation. And I thought, okay, starting my own firm would, would be a good, good uh, way to go. But even more, I think uh, when I thought, well, wait a minute, if you're going to start a firm, why don't you become a little more disruptive than that mm -hmm. and use some of the technologies that have disrupted all these other industries to, at the margin at least, uh, disrupt our industry. So uh, social media, you know, giving away our research uh, and, and really doing that to educate, that is one of our missions and values, but uh, also to engage with the communities we're researching, you know, those who are doing the innovating and, uh, and become a part of those communities. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I think it's given us an enormous competitive edge because most compliance departments in traditional asset management firms will not let their portfolio managers or their analysts say anything about uh, their research or their portfolios on social media. Uh, we've, uh, we hired someone from the SEC to help us with that, and I think we're on the right side of regulation. It's been, it's been enormous, the, the, um, uh, the gratitude we get for the research we share and for the investment ideas that we share freely, uh, since we uh, disclose our holdings at the end of every day, and we also disclose our trades. Uh, so we have a lot of people, you know, with their PAs, their personal accounts, uh, looking at what we do day to day, and others who don't want to do that themselves. They just say, "I'll let you do it. This is what your, this is your area of expertise." So. It's been, it's been a wild ride from $15 million in October of 2014 uh, to north of $75 billion, as you said uh, earlier, and um, very gratifying. Fantastic. So Rupal, turning to you, how does integrate innovation into your portfolios at Ariel Investment? And, and also, can you talk about, is innovation just the domain of young upstart companies or do you find companies in, with your, in your portfolio who are quote unquote traditional who can innovate? Um, well, thank you for that. It's always hard to follow Kathy Woods on that topic of innovation, uh, but I'll try. Uh, no, I don't think innovation is a preserve of just upstart companies. Um, I think Kathy makes a fair point that there was an arbitrage between private and public markets. Uh, I personally believe that a lot of investors got very complacent and did research in a very traditional, backward-looking way. Uh, I'm a non-consensus thinker, uh, and I'm a contrarian. So I believe you can actually identify innovation amongst incumbent companies and arbitrage that by having a long-term horizon. 
I think that's the disconnect sometimes between the private markets and the public markets. It takes time to generate a payoff from an R&D investment, and it takes patience. Um, and that's sometimes lacking uh, in people who invest based on benchmarks and based on tracking errors. Uh, I don't. So I think with that kind of freedom, uh, we've invested in a lot of companies in a country where people rarely associate that country with innovation because it's known to be a country that's socialist. And of course, we identify innovation with capitalism. And yet, this country has over-indexed on innovation. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about which country I'm going to mention in the world. I hope it blows your mind. Uh, whenever I talk to my clients, uh, they are stunned by it. So here's the answer. It's France. French companies, you look at Airbus, the aircraft that they came up with, in terms of the Airbus 330 and the 350 and the whole line, it is giving a run for the money to Boeing. Dassault Systems, uh, they do CAD CAM software. Uh, and even IBM could not produce that kind of software. No American company has produced that kind of heavy duty, uh, three dimensional software that Dassault does. Uh, and I can go company after company. If you think Louis Vuitton is not innovative, you've got something coming in the luxury market and Hermes and L'Oreal. I mean, you look at Procter & Gamble, L'Oreal has stolen a march on P&G in America in the category of shampoos. So I think innovation can happen anywhere, anyhow, if you put your mind to it in any sector. And as an investor, if you think outside the box, which is I really think what Kathy is talking about, you can find opportunity everywhere. Uh, so we own a lot of these sorts of companies. Safran comes to mind. Uh, it's in our portfolio, for example. It came up with a composite material to produce a next-gen aircraft engine. It had to spend billions of euros in R&D in the first 10 years or so. Um, and it wasn't reporting profits, you know, from that endeavor because the revenues are not there, but the costs are sort of like what happens in a Tesla or it happens in any of these newer companies. It just happened to be a publicly listed company. But now that they've got this product commercial on the market, you have a 15 years line of sight uh, to the spare parts aftermarket opportunity, which is their business model. So I think if you look for it, you can find it anywhere. And if I can tie it back, therefore, to diversity and inclusion, I think that's what it's all about. If you know how to look for it, you'll find it everywhere. And what you'll actually find is that diverse people tend to be the most innovative because they've got to be. <laughs> they've been left behind. And so for them, it's differentiate or die. And so I think if allocators want to get a piece of innovation, they should back diversity. It comes full circle to inclusion. A very well-spoken point. So Michaela, pivoting to the second aspect of this conversation about innovation and inclusion, tell us about your vision to disrupt and transform the asset management um, industry and some of the catalysts that have driven your journey um, to this point? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I would say uh, the underrepresentation that we have in asset management of both female but also black and brown investors really hasn't budged much in the last two decades. And for me, that is something that we need to address, especially on the pipeline side of it. So at Capricorn, we've spent over a decade um, seeding and anchoring new emerging early stage managers. And what we find is really two things. Uh, one being that there's a lot of innovation. There's entrepreneurial models that are happening with, with new managers. And secondly, I would say, um, is that there's a broader set of representation. So by just being earlier, earlier stage, we get a bigger opportunity set, it's less efficient, but also you get the opportunity for, to partner with the likes of Kathy Woods and the RuPaul's of, of the world early on. And on that, we really want to partner with these new fund managers. We want to bring them to scale so that we can crowd in other institutional investors. And hopefully we will at some point get an industry that is representative of the world that we live in. I sure hope so. So Jolene, Given your role at UBS overseeing the firm's top advisors who serve 
large family offices. Can you offer perspective um, from your client base as it relates to the issue of female founders, both as fund managers and business owners? Do they have a different perspective? Yeah, so I am actually thrilled to be up here. And Lisa, thank you for, I have a very different background than my colleagues on the stage. So um, I'd like to offer it from the family office perspective because we've done at UBS a lot of analysis around this. And for the family offices in the room, thank you for leading. And this will resonate with you as I'm speaking for sure. So I think this actually might be a watershed moment where family offices who have grown in stature, in wealth, in buying power, in influence in the investment community, this is the moment for you all to make the change. And there's four reasons why I think this could be a very pivotal moment for this challenging issue that I've been facing for three and a half decades in my career. One, it's the family office's global wealth increasing. I mean, we, we saw family office assets soar. They're getting wealthier. They're getting more influential. The second trend is the institutionalization of the family office. You are all so smart. You are disintermediating Wall Street. You are doing deals. You are seating managers. You are clubbing direct investments into private companies. That whole trend gives you tremendous power to actually move the needle, and you are. Um, I think the third thing, which I will talk about a little bit more hopefully later in the conversation, is we are in the midst of somewhere, depending on who you ask, 30 to $60 trillion generational wealth transfer. Well, guess what? That is disproportionately going to women. We have all the statistics on that. And the fourth issue tied to that is how do women invest? How do millennial women, how do next-gen women invest? They're investing with purpose. We have the stats on this. 65% of our family offices that we surveyed in our global family office report have said that they are investing with ESG principles and that that is going to constitute 25% of their asset allocation within the next five years. When I look at the confluence of these four factors, I say, Bring it on. The family offices are the ones that actually can change the equation here. Seed hedge funds that are started by women. Seed direct women-owned businesses that are increasingly solving corporate, you know, I mean, uh, global issues. Put your buying power here. And I, I see it happening, and I'm super excited about it. That's incredibly exciting and encouraging. So can we go back to through history, Kathy? When you were starting um, ARC, there's this whole emerging manager programs that we've all heard lots about. Um, I think it's been a uh, focus of New York State in particular. What was your personal experience? And were they some of the big underwriters when you were just starting out on this vision to pursue innovation? Not at all. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, what happened is, uh, you know, the institutional world, which these uh, consultants serve, had gone, also had gone, um, the consultant world, had moved towards benchmarks, and we looked absolutely out of our minds. And so just uh, too volatile, too uh, radical, uh, you know, so, so they, they were interested, you know, because it was daring, they thought, but they could, they could never come around. And uh, I understand it. It's the world they grew up in. So I'm just happy I grew up more in the 70s, 80s, 90s when I, I knew that, and I've, this might sound a little cheeky, but, you know, when I was describing what I wanted to do, what I felt was missing in the investment world, when it came to innovation, cert certainly, someone not even in the business said to me, oh, so you mean the future of investing is investing in the future? And I said, yes, <laughs> yes, benchmarks are backwards looking. And if, as we believe, there are four major uh, innovation platforms that are going to 
transform, we think, every industry uh, out there. And, and, and the convergence of those technologies is going to be very confusing, but is going to present explosive growth opportunities. Um, we, uh, we, we had to go out and go social to get our message out. They understood much more than the consultants who were kind of um, the anchored to these benchmarks. And I think that anchor is going to become a dead weight if they don't watch out. So you didn't fit in the box. I didn't fit in any box. You didn't fit in any box. No. So you created your own box or yes. your own canvas. Yes, and, and just on that, I'm going to uh, credit uh, MSCI. Uh, in 2018, MSCI uh, actually came to us and said, Would, it seems as though what you're doing here is creating a new asset category. Um, I won't say asset class, but much like the emerging markets, mm -hmm. they uh, moved from, they helped uh, in, invent, I suppose, the investability of emerging markets by combining countries in one portfolio. That seemed radical and transformational at the time. Well, we're doing the same with innovation. Uh, and the correlation, um, correlations among these 14 technologies involved in these five platforms uh, is not that high, surprisingly. Which is exciting. So Rupal, you've also been hugely successful. So globally, the number is even more disturbing. Only one point. Um, 3% of total global assets are run by diverse managers. You were one of them. So tell us, what was your own path and experience with being um, in the, the, <clears throat> the DEI space? Did you get encouragement? Were there certain pockets that were supportive? Tell us the story. Well, I think I get asked this question a lot. You know, what does it feel like to be one of the rare female portfolio managers and the only answer I can give is not successful or great or gratified. It feels lonely. There should be more of us. And I think that's what needs to change. Um, and I've said this five years ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, and the clock is ticking. And I think the numbers don't move. And I think that's the travesty. But I, I do believe that the future is going to look very different from the past. And there is going to be a disruption of a different sort in our industry, which is to say it's been easy to invest passively and not think about it uh, because markets have gone up. You know, a bull market, you can suspend your thinking and just go long and think that you are skilled even if you're just lucky. But I don't think the next decade or the decade thereafter, it's going to be that easy to make money passively. You know, valuations in the markets are sky high. And you really got to curate your portfolio. You got to pick your spots. And those are the kinds of things that I think people on this side of the table, you know, tend to do. Uh, we pick our spots. We don't just lean on a benchmark and accept, you know, whatever it brings to us. Um, we differentiate from it, you know, we actually stand out. Um, and I think when it comes to therefore picking managers, not just picking asset classes, people will have to think outside the box there too. Because the incumbents have really just hugged the benchmark. And it's been fine. And so have the allocators, and that's fine because the benchmarks just kept going up. But when they don't, and they actually start coming down, and you have what I call, for the first time potentially, a protracted bear market, which we frankly never had you know, for 70 years, right? We've had quick ones, we've had short-lived ones, uh, but we've never had a protracted one. Now, I cover global equities, and I can tell you, I covered Japan, tortuous. Try going passive, investing in a market that's falling. <laughs> You'll have your head handed to you. <laughs> and, and I think that um, the U.S. markets uh, and every Western market, you know, like we went through in many other markets in the world that have done nothing but fall if they simply stop thinking, all you experience is losses. 
So in investing, ignorance is not bliss, it's loss. So I think they will wake up to the reality that they need to do things differently. And part of that means looking for new blood. And new blood happens to be divorce. It's not pale, male, and stale. It's usually female. And I think that's what's going to turn the numbers, partly, because they will have no choice. That said, I think if they are smart about it, they will try to get ahead of that curve. Because one of the things about active management is that it's capacity gated. Uh, try getting into Cathy's funds now at 70 billion compared to when she was at 10 or 15 million as she started out. It's harder and harder to put that money to work. So you need to get in early. And part of that means trying to identify that talent early on. That is the market inefficiency that allocators can exploit and should exploit if they are smart about it. But as they say, if you want to move the mouse, you got to move the cheese. <laughs> Otherwise, a mouse ain't moving. <laughs> so I think allocators, if they are serious about ESG, DEI, you know, all these buzzwords being thrown about, they need to set targets and they need to have consequences for meeting them or missing them. There haven't been any. And nobody got fired for hiring IBM. That's what's playing out in our industry. And look what happened in technology. I think a lot of people eventually did get fired for hiring IBM. <laughs> and they would be well enough to learn from that industry into ours. Our industry is facing massive disruption, massive change, and people are willing, are in denial about it. So I would just suggest create targets, measure them, uh, hold people accountable for both meeting them and missing them. And that's how you move the mouse to the cheese. Sounds like a great idea. So Michaela, can you talk to us, what are the, some of the hurdles that less established managers face when being considered by larger institutions? And can you kind of think about how you changed um, the criteria used to um, enable to facilitate investment in this next generation of thought leaders and investors? Absolutely. I think uh, Rupal is spot on. There needs to be innovation in our industry, and that means the traditional way of allocating clearly hasn't worked for representation. And we all know the, the three major hurdles. They tend to be track record, scale or size, and pedigree. If you don't have a minimum of a three-year, hopefully a five-year track record, or a minimum of $100 million under assets, assets under management, and hopefully a name brand or two on your resume, either a school or a firm, um, you, don't, you don't check the box, right? So you get screened out. Um, now, when people look at a track record, I feel that they use that as a proxy for skill. We're saying, okay, I see the track record, there must be some skill here and not just luck, right? Well, I think that's, that's an easy way out. Um, I think performance is an outcome of people and process. And that's on the allocator side that we really need to do the job of identifying differentiated talent, differentiated process. So hopefully we can estimate that there's a probability of outperformance, right? And not only probability of outperformance, but a repeatability of that outperformance. That's the allocator job. And not being willing to do that, I think you leave a lot of alpha on the table by not being early. And on, um, when it comes to scale, what we found to be a good solution for a lot of our big ticket clients is to take a portfolio approach. You know, a lot of our big allocators can't allocate to a $100 million fund, but they want to get in. They want to be in the new startups, but they can't make the single ticket themselves. So if you can create a fund structure or a separate managed account, you can get around that. So if you find a compelling strategy, a team that you believe in, there's ways around it if you're willing to. Um, and then lastly, on pedigree, um, I would say, of course, it's easy to tick the box and you find comfort in, in name brands. But at the same time, as RuPaul was, was pointing out, um, I think there's a lot to be said for cognitive diversity and especially for innovation, right? You need creative solutions. And around that, I would say just working for a company that's a B corporation 
We have half of our firm from other countries globally. We have 50% women. I see it every day, the benefit of, of diversity of thought and of, of experiences and that it leads to creative solutions and bold decision making. I want that tension in the room of different views. I think that leads us to better decisions. So I think instead of just talking about the risk factors of going early and not having a track record, et cetera, I would love for us to switch it and say, well, what's the opportunity cost of, of losing out on the five first years of compounding returns? That's the cost, and it's not just risk. So Jolene, let's talk to you. The family office universe seems to be that could be at the forefront of this evolution and change. They have more flexibility. Often they are themselves innovators. They thought differently. So can you share some of your numbers about how millennials, Generation X, are likely to allocate and how they're going to think about their, their allocation in this great wealth transfer? Are they going to be more open to more innovative ways and innovative types of managers? Yeah, we, we think so. I mean, we've done a lot of measurement at UBS around family offices. We have an annual survey and we spend all our time in the ultra, at least I spend all my time in the ultra space and the global family office space. And I think there are a couple of trends that will, will help this, this dilemma and, and move the needle here. One, as I mentioned before, this 30 to 60 trillion that is coming over the next, you know, 20 years will go to women. We need to see more women step up in their family offices. You know, the endowment and foundation market has a lot of female CIOs. We don't have as many in the family office. I hope that that, you know, will be a sea change. But as it speaks to, uh, to speak specifically to millennials, we see a lot of families coming to us, the, ge the generation one saying, oh my gosh, my grandchildren, they want to change how we do everything from philanthropy, the causes we give to. As everyone knows, millennials are more left-leaning, so their politics are very, very different. How will that change? One, they care about climate, they care in a post-COVID world about how women in particular have been affected globally by COVID disproportionately. You know, they care about social inequity and gender parity. So as we see this cohort, millennials, by the way, they're 70 million strong. They're actually bigger than the boomer generation right now in number. As we see them grow in their family offices, as they get wealth passed to them, I actually think we're gonna see a change in how the money is allocated, who the leaders of the next generation asset managers are. So finally, we're running out of time, but as four powerful change agents and leaders, if you can each make one specific recommendation or aspiration, what would it be? So Kathy, can we start with you? Sure. In terms of, are you talking about for women? To, to women, to increase the number. So how do we get from 3% to 10%, right, Rubel? Or maybe yeah. 25 do well, you have a couple of ideas? 10% by 2025, 30% by 2030, and 50% by 2050. We'll give you guys time. <laughs> uh, well, I, I ha I'm on record as saying I've loved being a woman in this business. I have because when I started, it was 77. I was in college, quite young very low expectations, but I had high ambitions. And, uh, you know, it's easy to surprise if you're, if you're willing uh, to put yourself out there, make yourself vulnerable. Uh, so the first is participate, as, but uh, only if you have really good ideas that actually are, are questioning the conventional wisdom. And then in terms of, start, uh, in terms of the career itself, Make sure you move into a position where you can be measured for better or worse. Uh, so last year was better for us. This year, of course, you take your performance with you. You know, it's uh, no one's going to take that away from me and ARC. Uh, and by the way, I'm not worried about this year's performance. Just saying we have a five year time horizon. And then the third thing is if you want to start your own business, look for a huge unmet need out there. What is missing? And I think there are there is a lot missing. 
uh, in the financial world uh, right now that innovators come, can come in and, and change. Sounds good. What about you, Jolene? Women have to invest in other women. As we get wealthier, we have to put our money into other women, other successful women. So money's power, right? We haven't always done that, by the way. <laughs> Michaela, what about you? I say set a target and work towards it. Whatever that allocation is, if it's realistic and measurable, you can get there. Rupal, you have some bold numbers. I like numbers. Um, well, we'll come up with a pledge because I think people need to sign up for these things uh, yes. and we need to measure them against it. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, but I think in terms of suggestions, again, innovation to the rescue. Uh, you know, board members and board seats, uh, women are very underrepresented on corporate boards, uh, even in this country, but worldwide. And one headhunter, uh, you know, decided uh, that she would only present female candidates whenever any board search took place uh, to the NOMGov committees. Uh, and initially, you know, all she would tell the NOMGov chairman and the members of the board is that, look, let the women go first. If you don't like any of them, I'll present you with a male candidate, but first, go check out these women. And there's not been a single instance when she's done that, they've ever had to go back and identify a male candidate. So I think there are lessons and parallels here for us too in asset management. You know, insist on finding diverse managers. Tell your consultants, tell your clients, tell whoever it is that you are, only find me women. And I won't give you business if you don't find me women. That's what happened to the head, you know, that's, that's the mandate she put forward, right? And suddenly they're able to find all these women. And that's what happened in another shop, you know, where the boss was looking to increase, you know, diversity in his team. And initially, you know, his own team said, well, we can't find anybody, we can't, you know, it's not possible, there aren't any. And he said, okay, we won't fill the position. Well, the moment he said, we're not going to fill the position, they were like, oh my God, we have to do all this work. <laughs> they found a divorce candidate. And, and so I think sometimes you just got to draw the line. Draw and the it's line. about time. Okay, so it sounds like we need a step change in the asset management industry. This illustrious group of women are going to create a manifesto and try to brainstorm on actionable next step items with metrics and a call to action for you to take advantage of this fantastic opportunity of diverse thinking, innovative thinking in the next generation. So thanks everyone today, this was exciting and we'll be back.